Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 5. Just read a few verses here. This is about the time of Noah. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We're going to talk about grace tonight. And I want us to understand this, this statement and the, the subject. It's very important for us. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now the next verse, it's an interesting description. It says, these are the generations of Noah. And Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now reading that, you might think, well, Noah found grace because he was such a great father. You know, he was, just a, he was just a good man. But I want you to, to see God's description of grace and God's uh, understanding of why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The, the Bible tells us that God's grace is to us. God has shown grace uh, to us. In, uh, I'm, I'm going to just read off a few verses on occasion tonight rather than asking you to, to turn there. For instance, Titus chapter 2 verse 3 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace is unto all. In fact, uh, Romans 3 says, they're talking about the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. God's grace, God's righteousness is unto all, and it's upon all them that believe. You see, God's grace is received by faith. And that's, that's so important. Uh, when, when he says it's unto all, that, that word, you don't have to define it. You don't have to worry about having some strange meaning. It just means what you think it means. God's righteousness, God's grace is unto all. And it's upon all them that believe. Now you can, you can turn there or just uh, listen to Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, in verse 6, God talks about Noah. And the, the verse before, verse 6, he, he makes a statement about faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He makes a statement about faith. The next verse he says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Now, it's important for us to see Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God says it was because of faith. Now, faith just means he believed God and acted on it. You can imagine you know, how strange it would be to have God tell you, I'm going to destroy the world, but I want you to make an ark. Uh, one comedian used to say, what's an ark? You know, uh, you know, it would never have happened before. And yet he believed God. He did exactly what God said. Uh, I'm sure uh, people opposed him. Uh, you, know, you can imagine all the things that could have happened. But Noah found grace because of faith. It wasn't that he was just a good fellow. He was the only person who would believe God. And uh, that's so important. Uh, we, we receive God's grace by faith. That was true of Noah. It's true for us as well. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. He pretty much gives us a definition of grace there. Grace means a gift. A gift normally is paid for by the giver. <laughs> if somebody offers you a gift and then asks you to pay for it, you tell them, that's not actually a gift, <laughs> all right? And when God offers you a gift, he's already paid for it. It's grace. God's gift is received by faith. Now, you can refuse a gift. Have you ever had it happen? I have. You, you go to give somebody something, they say, no, thanks. The classic example to me is when you're going down the, the mall, and there's people in the middle who want to give you something, <laughs> Uh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, that's kind of the way you feel a lot of times about 
you're trying to tell people about the Lord. Excuse me. Oh, no, no. You know, people aren't always interested in, in the gift of God and the gift of salvation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 says as well, you can neglect a gift. How many of us here have ever gone to Bunnings and bought something you already owned? <laughs> I know I have, you know. I uh, can't find it. You know, you, you neglect a gift sometimes. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? You know, there's a lot of people who think, yeah, salvation, God. Th that sounds good. Maybe someday I'll look into that. I think I said this morning, uh, people who expect to do business with God at the 11th hour sometimes die at the 10th hour. Uh, we don't always get the chance to put it off. Um, a gift can be refused. A gift can, can be neglected. And, and grace is exactly that. God's grace. God's salvation. It, it's a gift. Uh, sometimes it's defined as unmerited favor. Uh, that's a pretty good way to look at it. You can't earn or deserve God's gift of salvation. And, and the problem is, much of religion is based on the idea that we can be good and earn our way to heaven. Someone, some, at some point, took English, took the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, and put words to each letter. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a pretty good, pretty good definition of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's why the Bible says that it's through Jesus Christ. It, it was his expense. He paid the price. Um, you know, there's, there's things the Bible says that we can only receive by grace. One of those is forgiveness. In uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, talking about Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You can only receive forgiveness from God by grace. You can't earn it. Uh, again, r religion is built on the ideas, you, you know, we'll, we'll pay back. And you get people a lot of times where they're doing religious activity. You know, they've been bad, so oh, I better do something good. Well, that's not the way it works with God. It's by grace. It's by grace. Romans chapter 5 says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Aren't you glad? Justification is something you can only receive by grace. Now, justification, to, to me, the easiest way to look at it is being right with God. You know, sometimes people will say, I need to get right with God. Well, the only way to get right with God is by grace. God has to give it to you as a gift. Uh, that's Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I noticed as I was studying grace, the word redemption kept coming up. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Redemption has to do with buying something back. It has to do with paying a price. Christ paid the price. He's our Redeemer. And because He paid the price, He can offer us the gift of, of salvation. I think I've already quoted Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. The problem is, unfortunately, many of us prefer work to grace. Now those are opposites. Work and grace in the Bible. If you want the opposite of grace, it's, it's works. And isn't it interesting that Ephesians 2.9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I wonder why we would prefer works. Maybe it's because we prefer boasting, to humility. That's just a, that's common to man. Women and children as well. Uh, it's just common to, to humans. Uh, we're, we're proud. We don't like to humble ourselves. But God says we can only receive salvation by grace. Many people would rather trust themselves than to trust God. There's a verse in Galatians. Let me read it to you. Galatians 5 and verse 4. It's an interesting verse. He says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. 
Now, what he's saying there is if, if you're going to try and be justified by keeping the law, Christ will make no difference. You see, you can't be justified by the law. I, I don't care how many laws you keep, you'll have broken some of them. If you're going to try and be justified by the law, he said, you're making uh, Christ of no effect. But you know, we, in ourselves, we would rather try and be proud and say, well, I'm, I'm good enough. You ask people, you try it sometimes. Ask 10 people. If you died today, do you think you'd go to heaven? I'll, I'll guarantee it, nine out of 10 at least, maybe nine and a half if such a thing could happen, uh, will say, yeah, I've been good. <laughs> it won't matter how, how bad they've been, they've been good. Uh, the Bible says that we pervert the gospel when we do that. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. He's talking to the church there at Galatia. And the, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So when we try to present the idea of salvation by works, God says that's a perversion of the the gospel is that Christ died for us, that he was buried and rose again, that he paid the price for our salvation. Some people deny that they're sinners, and yet God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 5, 6, it says, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us, folks. Everyone needs God's grace. And the amazing thing is that it's available to everyone. Uh, we read Titus 2, 11, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace to us. It's found in Jesus Christ. Now, someone wrote these words. It's a song originally. Were it not for grace, I can tell you where I'd be. Wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go the battles I would face, forever running but losing the race, were it not for grace. So here's all my praise expressed with all my heart, offered to the friend who took my place and ran a course I could not even start. But though he saw in full just how much his love would cost, he still went the me in heaven so I would not be lost. Were it not for grace. God's grace is available to each one of us. Were it not for grace, we would be lost. And when God's grace, when you receive God's grace by faith, God's grace then begins a work in you. God's grace comes to you, and when you receive it by faith, He begins a work in you. Look with me, if you would, at John chapter 1. I think this will encourage you. John chapter 1 uh, several verses, starting in verse 11 there. I think it's important for us to understand that when we trust Christ as Savior, we have God's grace. Uh, we don't have to seek it anymore. We, we've received His, His grace. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 11, very uh, familiar verse to many. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. For the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. That's Jesus. And when you receive Jesus, look at verse 16. Of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Listen, there's no more grace you can get other than what you get in Jesus Christ. There's no other grace you need. There's no more. You don't have to seek for something else. Uh, in Christ, you get the fullness of His grace. Verse 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad? Grace, grace, God's grace. We have His grace. Uh, all of His fullness we received in, in Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that God wants us and encourages us to grow in grace. He, he makes exactly that statement in 2 Peter uh, chapter 5 when he says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That just means know the Lord more. 
get to know him, uh, his word, and what he's like, and you'll be, become more like him. He'll be helping you to, uh, to, to grow, to become more like Jesus in your thoughts and in your actions. If you look in Romans chapter 5, the, the Bible says that God's grace needs to reign in our lives. Now that word reign means to rule, R-E-I-G-N. Romans chapter 5 Now, something that reigns or someone that reigns means they're in charge. And uh, we're supposed to do what they say. Now, I, we tell our kids that, you know. You're supposed to do what we say. They don't, they don't always believe us. Uh, but when God speaks, uh, God is to, to be the ruler in our hearts. And he, he makes uh, some statements here. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. He says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you see the contrast he's, he's making there? Uh, we got saved by his death. When you get saved, then you enter into his life. And how much more he's going to do for you by his life. You know, before salvation, death reigned. A person without Christ is dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sins. And the Bible says that the law condemns us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Listen, the law is not there to commend you. We've never, I've never had a policeman stop me and say, Good job. <laughs> That's not what the law does, all right? The law condemns us. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And as sin hath reigned unto death... Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. See, before we were saved, death reigned. The law reigned and condemned us. But when you get saved, grace reigns. Grace is in charge. And this verse is what it's all about. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He's saying when grace reigns, you're not under sin and, and death's rule anymore. You don't have to do what they say. I, I had an experience some years ago where I had a boss I didn't really like a lot. And uh, when I quit that job and went off to university, I came home for, I think it was the summer or Christmas or something, and my mother still worked at the place. And, and she said, we, we need a, I had a really important job, dishwasher. Uh, we need a dishwasher tonight. Can you come in? Okay. Make a little money. Uh, well, the boss said that night, now, I need you to work tomorrow. Well, the next day was Sunday. I said, I'm not, I'm not working tomorrow. If you want to work here, you have to come in tomorrow. I don't want to work here. <laughs> she wasn't my boss anymore. She didn't reign anymore. And that's exactly the way it is with, with sin and death. Listen, you can go into work if you want to, but you don't have to. You don't have to. Grace is to reign in your life. We don't have to serve sin anymore. Verse 14, he says in Romans 6, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. He said, this is not an excuse to sin. He's saying, this is showing who's the boss. The Lord's the boss. Grace is the boss. And uh, that's how we need to operate. God's grace in us. It's different than the old dead life we had. Uh, it's a life in Christ. And what a blessing it is. God's grace to you. God's grace in you, set free from sin. Well, uh, the third thing tonight I want you to think about is God's grace from us. You know, when you receive God's grace and God's grace begins to work in you, it should make a difference how you relate to God and to people. Uh, look in, in John chapter 13, and let me just give you an example of the grace of Jesus. Now, there's, there's many places we could look, of course, but... Uh, John chapter 13, it's a, it's a familiar portion where Jesus washes the feet of the, of the disciples. John chapter 13, let me just read a few verses, starting in verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wash them and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Uh, Peter said, well, you know, what are you doing here? 
Uh, and Jesus later on in, in verse um, 12 explains, He said to them, know, know you what I've done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Isn't that gracious? Isn't that humbling? You know, he humbled himself. He was a servant. And that's our example that Jesus has given to us. Later on, that same chapter, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. You know, when we receive God's grace, he begins a work in us to make us like Jesus. And let me tell you, there's, once you get saved, there's nothing you can do to stop it. <laughs> you are predestined to be like Christ. And someday you'll not only be like him, you'll be with him. You know, what, a, what a blessing that is. But that's, that's another subject. Uh, uh, we'll want to be like Jesus when God's grace has, has taken hold in us. We'll want to be a servant. We'll be willing most of the time to set aside our glory, our dignity, like Jesus did. In 2 Corinthians, it says of Jesus, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. God's grace seen in Jesus Christ. And God's grace will change how we think and how we act. We don't always think of it in, in these terms, but it will change how we think and act toward God. And that's important. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 and 2. Let me find that. Ephesians 5, verse 1 says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Sweet-smelling savor. We're going to want to be right with the Lord. We're going to want to have, it sounds odd, we're going to want to have the right smell before the Lord, the right savor, the right essence, maybe we could say. Our, our attitudes will change. Have you ever heard somebody say, you have a stinking attitude? That's exactly what we're talking about. We don't want a stinking attitude. We want a sweet-smelling savor, especially toward the Lord. You know, there's times in our life when we, we can be so critical and ungrateful toward God. You know, I meet people all the time who are, well, if God is like that, you know, they're so critical and ungrateful toward Him. But when you've received His grace, your attitude changes, and you praise Him, and you thank Him, and you're grateful. Uh, in Hebrews, he says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Uh, the grace of God will change your attitude toward God. Uh, the, the film we showed uh, Friday night was talking about uh, who we are, our identity. If, if you're, if you, the man in the film, he, he, he thought he was a coach. That, that was the first thing he thought about. He had to change from that to realizing the main thing he is is a Christian. And if you're a Christian, man, everything else that happens, well, Lord knows, and off we go. Uh, it can change our heart. Uh, God's grace will change our heart in our attitudes and our actions toward him, and it'll make us grateful. It'll also change us toward people. Uh, there's a, a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and, and verse 14, and I found it interesting that the verses that I, that I came up with on this, that most of them have to do with a savor, a smell. It'll change our attitude towards lost people, people that are not Christians. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now for some people, you're going to be the smell of God. You're going to be the savor. He says, uh, maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Our, our relationship to the Lord is going to make a difference to other people. If they see you being bitter against God or ungrateful or, or disobedient, they're going to think, oh, that, that, didn't, that didn't smell too good. But he goes on, uh, look at um, verses 15 and 16. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, 
and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? And what he's saying there is people will respond to the smell of the Lord in different ways. Uh, you've had it happen. There'll be a smell in your home, and someone will say, ooh, that smells good. And someone else will say, ooh, what's that? <laughs> uh, people will respond to the Lord in different ways. Some will respond with delight. Some will respond with disgust. But we don't have to change our savor to suit them. In fact, let me warn you, don't try to change how Christ comes across to people to try and get them to re receive it gladly. Uh, they've got to trust the Christ of the Bible. Uh, we don't want to follow, I remember learning as a kid about situation ethics. You ever heard of situation ethics? It's where you decide what you believe by what's going on around you. Listen, as Christians, we need to just uh, live and love the grace of God. And God will sort out how people respond to it. Uh, it's not up to us to be hypocritical about uh, what we believe and, and what we do. The same smell will delight some and disgust others. We need to have the right attitude toward lost people. And he makes a statement there in verse 16, who is sufficient for these things? What he's saying is, none of us are smart enough to work out how we should smell to every person to make them happy. You know, sorry to use that illustration. It's, it's not a very, very pretty one, but who is sufficient for these things? We're not sufficient. And the next verse says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God and the sight of God, speak we in Christ. We need to be sincere, godly, biblical Christians. Now, we need to be kind. We need to be gracious. But we can't change the truth. And we, can't, we shouldn't cover it up or, or excuse it. Now, we need to just live for the Lord and let the Lord change people's hearts. Now, we aren't smart enough to change to suit every person. We just need to suit the Lord. And we need to be guided by God's Word. He'll keep us right even when people say we stink. <laughs> and we need to just be happy to be a sweet-smelling savor uh, to the Lord. God will change us toward Him, toward the lost, but as well toward believers. Uh, in Galatians chapter 6, he makes this statement, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We need to be gracious toward each other. Um, maybe you're wrong today. I might be wrong tomorrow. I need to be really careful. I, I always remember driving along with the kids one time, and, and I very uh, critically said, look at that guy driving over there. He doesn't have his lights on. And I looked down, and my lights weren't on. <laughs> and you know, aren't we that way? We're so quick to criticize others and excuse ourselves. Uh, we need to be gracious towards people in general, but especially towards other Christians, towards believers. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, he gives us a lot of things. I won't read the whole chapter, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, uh, 29. He says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. See, there's, what, there's our job. Ministering grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ministering grace unto the hearers. Uh, that should be our attitude toward each other. I've noticed over the years that sometimes people are very graceful toward lost people and hard on Christians. I've seen it happen. I've known a man who you know, was very gracious in his, his witness and testimony to lost people, but so hard on his son that, that his, his own son found it hard to be around him. We kind of do that in families, don't we? We'll say things to our family we would never say to somebody else. And we just think, well, they've got to love us. <laughs> but folks, that's, that's not the way it should be. And the same at church and with, with Christians and with people. We need to be gracious. Uh, 
Sometimes in our earthly family, we can be so, so unkind. And, and then sometimes we don't even say, I was wrong or I'm sorry. We just let time take care of it. And time doesn't really take care of it. It just kind of crusts, crusts over. We, uh, we don't want to live that way. Uh, God has shown grace to us, hasn't he? He gave his very best in Jesus Christ. Uh, if you're saved, his grace is working in you. And he's working with, with you. And he wants to show his grace from you. God wants his grace. He wants us to minister grace uh, to the hearers. Uh, I would end with, with two questions tonight. One, have you believed and accepted his gift of grace, salvation? Has there been a time in your life when you said, Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. I believe you died for me and rose again. Please save me. Lord, give me your grace. He, he's offered it. The gift of God is eternal life. He's offering it freely. You can neglect it, you can refuse it, or you can re receive it. As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. If you have trusted Christ, are you growing in grace? Are you letting God use the situations of your life uh, to make you more like Jesus? Toward God, toward people. Uh, James 4, 6 says, but he giveth more grace. Now listen, there's no lack. Uh, God has plenty of grace. And he, he makes it available to you. You can give as much away as you, you possibly can, and you'll never run short. He giveth more grace. Let's, let's go to him in prayer this evening. Their heads bowed in, in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart tonight. Maybe there's an area of grace that you need to do business with the Lord. Maybe you need to be saved. Uh, maybe you need uh, to, to forgive someone or uh, to take care of, a, of an issue with, uh, with someone. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Lord, you know our hearts, you know uh, our actions, you know the secret things of our lives, and uh, Father, you love us in spite of ourselves. Uh, while we were enemies, you said that you loved us and died for us. Father, help us to trust you and your grace. I pray, Father, if there are those here this evening that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would help them to see their lost condition, help them to trust you. Lord, help us as Christians to be gracious and kind. Help us not to be um, unkind and careless with, with our words. Father, thank you for your grace, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought we'd end with uh, the song. It's page 200.